I think uh, a lot of people know that we're going to get to the, the, the meat of the story with Network Solutions and the stuff you've been doing afterwards. But um, before that, give us like a quick, up, you know, kind of a, a summary of, you know, where are you from? And I know you got some, uh, you went to Northwestern and then Mizzou Law School and stuff. But what brought you to D.C. and what led you to, you know, kind of get into, uh, into business technology? Sure. Um, I grew up in a little town in southeast Missouri, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. The only reason that any of you would ever know it, it's the home of Rush Limbaugh. So we all went to Central High School together. He's a little younger than I am. And we also were co-disc jockeys on KGMO in Cape Girardeau. So for all of you who like KGMO in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Um, and um, I was, um, my dad was a small businessman, so I grew up being a janitor, a truck driver, and a salesman. And at one point in Chicago, when I went to school, I worked for a summer in McDonald's. So I learned an awful lot about the value of work and, you know, perseverance and stick with it. And it doesn't matter what you do. If you're out there working to make a living, uh, that's an honorable thing to do. So I came to Washington TN. Um, out of graduate school, undergraduate and graduate school at Northwestern, and uh, those were the days of Vietnam. So my introduction to Washington was, uh, I had my naval uniform on, I walked out on Constitution Avenue and people spit on me. So if you think we got troubles today in this country, you think about that time, and I will never forget it. Those were my contemporaries. There were a million people demonstrating here on the streets of Washington, and they had no respect, those people, for the United States military. So um, we should all think about that and the people who protect us because they don't deserve that kind of treatment. So I came, uh, I was a Naval Reservist in graduate school, and they sent me to Washington, and I went to the Office of Naval Research, which is the advanced uh, science technology part of the United States Navy. Two weeks later, they shipped me to something, some strange place called ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which of course became DARPA, which you all know, which has been responsible for the internet, stealth technology, satellite communications, you name it hundreds of billions of dollars of commercial technology as the advanced science technology part of the Department of Defense. So that's how I got here. Right, and um, so how did we connect the dots from law school to business? Yeah, when I came to Washington and I got very interested, while I was an undergraduate, um, I went to Northwestern on a debate scholarship. For all of you who follow debate at the college level, which is no one, uh, Northwestern has won more national debate championships than any school in history, Harvard being a far second for you Harvard people. And um, so I debated for four years, that's how I went to school, and um, I took a lot of technology courses at the Tech Institute. I was very interested in all this technology stuff. So those were the days we sat in a small data center with punch cards up until midnight trying to figure out how you programmed anything. So um, uh, I got very interested in the tech industry when I was at ARPA and I happened to be TN which led me years later to buy network solutions. I happened to be in the first users group of the ARPANET which is the internet when they threw the operational switch about two months before I showed up in 1969. So here we were sitting in front of dumb terminals, basically using email, first use of that ever in history, to communicate with our government contractors at places like MIT, Caltech, Northwestern was one of them, Michigan, IBM, et cetera. So I got very interested. When I got out of the military, I went back to law school, had no interest in practicing law, but I decided I want to be in tech business and I need some other kind of background. So I went back to the University of Missouri, got a law degree, went year round, two and a half years graduated. And the people at CACI who I had met uh, while I was at DARPA, uh, a fellow had become the CEO of CACI. He contacted me about nine months before I graduated, said, you want to come work for me and learn the tech business? I said, you bet. So I moved right back to Washington. Wow. You talk about ARPA and DARPA. You know, at what point did you realize that, because it was so new, right? You talk right. about the first emails that were sent. Yeah, at what point did you realize, hey, this thing could be huge? Uh, it first dawned on me in 1991 that it could be huge. So one of the lessons I've learned is uh, we are, in my mind, we are now in the 55th year of the long-term Internet wave. Uh, these things take decades 
to get to the point of fruition. There was no one in the internet business today or in those days who had any idea what this could become. Um, we all watched it, who knew anything about it, uh, developed through the 60s at ARPA, the 70s. Uh, it started to be used a little bit by the education community. No one else had any interest. In the 80s, it moved from DARPA to the National Science Foundation, and then when I bought Network Solutions, um, by then it, it moved in that transition period through the dot-com boom from the jurisdiction of NSF to the Department of Commerce. So the answer to your question is, um, I had watched this progression, and I started going to meetings at NSF in the late 80s about this development, continued development of the, by then, internet. And I had a lawyer who I found in Silicon Valley, uh, who's a guy named Jorge Del Cavo, who's still my lawyer out there today. And Jorge Del Cavo has done more IPOs in Silicon Valley than anybody except maybe Larry Sonsini. Do we have Wilson Sonsini? And I know Larry and work, have worked with him. But Jorge's probably done more tech IPOs than anybody in the Valley. So he's been there 40 years. And he said to me in 1990, because uh, I'd been talking to him about this. He said, you guys in Washington are the inventors of this stuff. You know about it. There are rumblings in the venture capital community in Silicon Valley about this Internet stuff. And we've got a few guys out here who know something about it. Nobody knows anything about it. And they are asking me to have them talk to people. So I talked to four or five companies in 1990 and 91, and I thought, uh, like all things in technology, once the VCs in Silicon Valley start rumbling around and kicking the tires, you better start paying to attention. This might become a commercial thing. So that's how my interest got peaked after almost, almost 25, 30 years, TN. So I think your debating background came in handy when you bought Network Solutions, because <laughs> you bought it for a great price. You want to tell us a little bit about that, and how, how did you sort of get them at such a, a, a low valuation, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then what did you see in this company? Yeah, now, re remember, uh, you ought to study history. I, I'm a, I love the history side of everything, but especially technology. Um, time and time again, you see things that nobody pays any attention to that have been around for years. And if you think that it has potential huge commercial application, you better start paying attention to it. And the sooner the better, but again, it takes decades. Uh, it took decades for the internet to reach commercialization takeoff. Um, so um, I, when I built a company here in Washington with a partner, Computer Systems Management. I left CAC, uh, SAIC, I'm sorry, CACI in 1979, because I'm an entrepreneur, uh, hocked my wife, my car, and my kids up, and we started Computer Systems Management, Roslyn. Uh, we basically worked for the Defense, Intelligence, and FAR DARPA, and um, uh, we ran that from 1979 to 1986, and in 1986, I decided I wanted to get on a bigger train. We were about 200 technical people, so I talked to five CEOs in town, and I was sent to La Jolla, California by the head here in Washington of SAIC, which is one of the five I contacted about selling the company. He said, you need to go see Bob Beister in La Jolla. I got on a plane a week later. I'd never met Bob Beister. He was a founder of SAIC, flew to La Jolla. I was supposed to meet him for an hour and a half, five hours later. I thought, this is the smartest technical entrepreneur I've ever met in the United States of America. He's got a great model. We ended up selling the company to Bob, and went, all of us went to SAIC uh, in December of 86. The lawyer I had retained, John Woods at Patton Boggs and Blow, to help me sell my company to Bob and SAIC, called me two months later in early 1987, and he said, uh, would you come have lunch with some guys at Tyson's Corner? They've got a small, dinky company called Network Solutions. Uh, they're thinking about making an acquisition. I'm their lawyer. I told them to talk to you. You've just been through the process. So I met the founders of Network Solutions on Boone Boulevard, five, five blocks from my office at SAIC, in early 1987. I liked them. They had networking talent. I ran all the networking at that time at SAIC, a bunch of other stuff. And uh, I started giving them subcontracts, got to know them, and uh, it led to them, when they won the cooperative agreement, which was a competitive bid that any company in the United States could have bid on in 1992, remember this, we're up to 1992 and nobody much still cares about the internet by 1992, right? 
four companies bid on that cooperative agreement and Network Solutions as a small company at Tyson's Corner won the exclusive cooperative agreement from the National Science Foundation to sell .com, .org, .net, .edu to every human being on earth and to also handle .gov, .mil, and every single country code for every nation on earth. And nobody basically cared at that time. Nobody saw the value in it. So they got a fixed price contract. I knew all that. I was dealing with them. I'd followed the evolution of this. I was listening to my lawyer in Silicon Valley. I thought, it's time to buy something like this. But I can tell you, again, in 1992, there was nobody in the internet business who had any idea what this would become or the billions, hundreds of billions that would return to shareholders, nobody. Right. I mean, you know, Mike also uh, co-wrote a book called Names, Numbers, and Network Solutions. And in the book, you talk about sort of five themes on growth. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about two of them. If you want to find out the other three, you got to buy the book. So, uh, buy the a great book. Read, it's on Amazon. What isn't on Amazon? It, this is a great read. It's a it's a history. Yeah. It's a history book, and it's it's recent history, obviously, but fantastic book. Very very well done. Thank you. Thank um, you. But one of your top five themes is what you're talking about, which is to be ready to exploit new opportunities. Right? Today's world, there's shiny objects everywhere. Mm -hmm. Lots of stuff. Lots of hot tech. You know, how do you? As an entrepreneur, and many entrepreneurs in the room, as well as angel investors who invest in entrepreneurs, how do you recognize, first of all, you know, what is a hot new opportunity? You talk about these waves that mm -hmm. take you know, decades. How can you see that forward? What, what kind of advice, what have you done, and, and what kind of advice would you give for someone to, to sort of identify which one of these shiny objects, and there's many of them, right, are gonna, are gonna wind up being you know, transformational? That's a great question, Tien. Uh, my answer to that, and we've all got a different answer, is um, number one, I live, I've lived half of my 40 years in business always in the government contracting industry here in Washington as we built a lot of major government contractors, kept them, taken them public, sold them. The other half of my life since 1995 when I bought Network Solutions has been in the global technology industry commercial technology. Uh, my answer to you is I'm, I am a big wave guy and, and I seriously mean that. We're in the, as I said earlier, we're in the 55th year of a long-term internet wave and it's nowhere near done. This is going to go on for decades. The second wave we've got which started I would say in my mind in the 80s was the uh, mobile wave and mobile communications. You marry the internet revolution wave with the mobile wave revolution and you couple that with the digitization of the globe which has been going on for a long time but it's really picked up speed I'd say in the last 10 years. You marry those three long-term waves, uh, you better be on one of them because if you are not on one of them, you're gonna get left behind. And these are three massive change waves that are creating and have created hundreds of billions of dollars of investor shareholder value for every company that figures out how to do this and execute. Those are the waves that I've focused on. And, and I would say to everybody in the room, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, use your background and talent to focus in a laser beam way on some part of those waves. It may not be your thing, but those are going to drive your business either in or out of business, whether you like it or not. These are massive waves that overtake the entire globe over time. So um, I've tended to focus on those waves for a lot, long time, TN, and um, I just think when you watch the shareholder value that is returned out of them as an individual investor or whoever you work with or your companies, um, that's how you figure this thing out. Um, I'll, I'll comment on the shiny object thing. Um, what you should really do is you should build a network of the smartest human beings you can anywhere on the globe who you talk to who understand these things because there are thousands of smarter people than me out there and all of us who really do understand these things in depth and you need to hear from them and get a context for this and figure out your place. And I would say turn off your devices and get out of this from time to time because we are so inundated with junk and crap in the modern world that you need to get away from this stuff. And 
That's why my other passion is being in the outdoors, which we may talk about at some point. That has given me the solitude in remote parts of the world to actually hike and trek and cycle and think about things. Because I'm telling you, it's hard to make your long-term decisions when you're being pounded seven days a week, 24 hours a day, by Facebook, the news media, and all the junk that surrounds us. And we are living in a junky time and world. Yeah, we, I definitely want to talk about how you get clarity and, and what you do for fun, because you've got some great stories there. Uh, another theme in your book is uh, know when to move on, mm -hmm. right? So can you expand on that a little bit? Because, you know, you hear about you got to be persistent, you got to be, don't ever give up, don't ever give up. At what point does an entrepreneur realize, you know what, I got to move on? Yeah. And, and then with that, your decision to sell the company for $19 billion five years after you bought it. Was that moving on? Yeah. So. Another great question. Um, you know, if you're building your own company and at some point you reach a wall, a stone wall, you're banging your head against the wall, you need to think about that, about whether you want to turn right, left, you want to shut it down, you want to try to sell out, you want to get on a bigger ship. There are lots of reasons you do that. It's all very personal. Um, I would say that one thing I've learned is you do need to know when to move on. Um, and uh, there may be a lot of reasons for that. But in our case, when uh, my partner and I built computer systems management, it was pretty clear to me uh, that, you know, uh, I, was, I personally was tired of being hocked up all the time because I was signing every bank note to keep 200 people employed. And that was a lot of money to me at those days. And, uh, you know, I thought this industry, the government contracting industry in the 1980s, I'd watched it since I got here in the late 60s. This is a big moving train. <laughs> the federal government is the biggest buyer on earth. Uh, there are tons of things to do, but I need more scale. I need more capability to do what I want to do. I made a decision at that point to sell out. We could have held on to computer systems, uh, systems management. So for me, I thought it's the right time to get on a bigger train. One of the best decisions we ever made, because when we joined SAIC, it was 500 million with 5,000 people. We ended up being $11 billion in 28 countries with 44,000 people. Largest privately held employee-owned science technology company in history based in the United States. Um, network solutions. I, I pestered Network Solutions for a year and a half, talking about buying their company. I made them five offers, so never give up, stay persistent. They turned me down every single time. I kept incrementally raising it up till they finally just gave up. I pestered them to death. And they sold it to me in March of 1995 for $4.7 million. The dot-com boom started. In 1997, we went public in the fall, right in the middle of the craziest time that I've ever lived through. Uh, we sold, uh, we raised $69 million at $18 a share, oversubscribed three times. Everything was hot that had internet on it. Um, in 1999, we went back out. We raised $779 million in the public markets. It was the largest internet uh, offering of all time at that time. A year later in 2000, we went back out and raised $2.3 billion, the largest internet offering of all time. And within four months after we raised the $2.3 billion in 2000, VeriSign came in and said, we'll pay you $19.3 billion for this thing that you bought for $4.7 five years earlier. Uh, that was time to move on. Right. <laughs> right. That, that's a great, that's awesome. And um, I don't know, if we have a, a great panel coming up on blockchain and crypto, but do you think it's time to move on from Bitcoin right now? Or, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on that. I, I, I've been buying in slow. No, I'm, I, I'm interested in hearing our panel. I don't right. know, but, you know, everybody ought to pay attention to that because of the underlying technology. Right. I mean, everyone would agree Bitcoin's hot, but you know what? A thousand dollars invested in uh, well, a dollar invested in network solutions became four thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and over a five-year period, I did some research this morning. That's triple what Bitcoin has done in the last five years. So, congratulations! So, as Thank hot you. as Bitcoin is, you're three X. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, those are times to move on, and you know, um, um, we were very fortunate, TN, because uh, in that uh, Forbes puts out a list like every two or three years. 
Network Solutions was you should own four other stocks before us in the time period from 1994 to 2004. We were only number five in appreciation of any public company in that 10-year period. Our appreciation was 3,357 percent. And uh, so, you know, all I can ever say is um, the best thing about that was that we put, out of all of that, we put $2.2 billion in cash back into the hands of the employee owners of SAIC. Every single person made a lot of money at SAIC off of that deal. And number two, when I read the letters that people sent me from across this country who'd purchased Network Solutions stock, and I'm serious about this, retirees and grandmothers in Kansas and Arkansas that said, thank you, Mr. Daniels, you have done the greatest thing on earth. You have doubled our retirement because we bought Network Solution. You know, business is about helping people, and we're the people who create jobs and wealth and give people quality of life. Uh, the government can help us do that, but we're the people who do that. And those are the things you take away from this. You need to help the people who work for you, and that helps this country. Great. I mean, I, I, yeah. And it's great to hear you talk about shareholder value. You don't hear that very often. You've mentioned that a dozen times already this morning, you know, creating wealth for, for your stakeholders. You're the chairman of a company that doesn't have, uh, is a nonprofit, mm -hmm. right, LMI. Right. Um, give us an update on LMI. What are they up to and uh, what, do you, um, what do you see for the future sure. there? Yeah, you know, I'm on the board of, I guess, five companies, and, and LMI is the only nonprofit. And what I would tell you about LMI is I, you know, I was in business here for many years, and I never competed against LMI and never knew anything about them. I knew some people who worked at LMI. Um, I had a couple of friends on the board of LMI who were rotating off, and they called me in 2017, and they said, uh, uh, Phil O'Dean, who a lot of you probably know, and Joe Casputis, who ran Primark and was head of DR and McGraw-Hill, blah, blah. And... Um, they both said, would you come on and take a look? So I went over there and I thought, this is a very interesting outfit. This is an, a company that is a nonprofit that was set up by President Kennedy and Robert McNamara, who was in Secretary of Defense in 1962. So LMI is an institution in this town. It survived for 55 years, and uh, it was an FFRDC for many years. Those of us who competed against FFRDCs didn't like FFRDCs, but it was changed to a nonprofit about 20 years ago by the Board of Trustees. So I went on the board board, and uh, then I became chairman in 2010. So I just show up as chairman once in a while. Everybody runs a place. Uh, we have a new CEO, Dave Zillette, who spent many years in, you know, one of the top executives in this uh, city, in uh, Northrop Grumman, CSC. Um, what LMI does is they were set up by Kennedy and McNamara at the start of the Vietnam War to be the defense logistics experts to the Department of Defense. They still have that role today. These are some of the top professional experienced consultants in the entire country who provide that advice. Uh, when I went on the board 10, we were maybe, LMI was maybe 80, 90 million. Today it's 250 million. So the board had never acquired anything. We acquired into healthcare, intelligence, uh, geographic location, San Antonio, Huntsville. So, you know, we want to provide opportunity for our employees, but it is a very high quality, great bunch of experience consulting, strategic planning, and implementation people for the government. And you also sit on the board of BlackBerry, mm -hmm. which is a different company today than it was <laughs> five years. Does anyone have a BlackBerry in the room? Just, we are, two, okay. Good, four, Bill. Five. Good, Bill. Keep your BlackBerry. <laughs> so, right. Um, where's BlackBerry going? You guys have had lots of turmoil over there, and, um, you know, I, I read up on it a little bit. You uh -huh. still have this amazing uh, encryption technology for secure email and things like that. But, you know, we're, you guys were the leading hardware, you know, mobile device maker back in the day. Right. Um, you know, where's the company going? Yeah. Uh, so the point of this story, which will be short and answer TN's question is, build your network and stay close to your friends and find the greatest entrepreneurs in America. So that's my conclusion about BlackBerry. Uh, we built a company here. All Silicon Valley VCs invested in a company in Chantilly, Virginia in the mid-2000s called Mobile 365. And Gino Picasso, Gino, raise your hand. Where's Gino? 
Gino is one of my best buddies, and we brought Gino in to be the CEO. Uh, the VCs got rid of the young CEO, and uh, these were all top of the line Silicon Valley guys investing in Chantilly, Virginia. Uh, four people had started that company, all tech guys here in the Washington area, and they basically brought the SMS and MMS messaging technology to the United States, and this was the leading company of its type sitting right here in Washington at that point in time for application and personal messaging. And um, so they threw the young CEO out, and they asked me to come in and be chairman and CEO for a while, and then I was smart enough to hire smarter people than me, so we hired Gino, and uh, I tend to do that a lot because I've learned I'm not the smartest guy in much of anything. I know a lot and I've been able to do things, but the thousands of people I've worked with in all these companies are the people who make these things go. And you can't do anything by yourself. You, you can be the spark plug and do what you do, but you need people and really good people. So. Um, we ended up selling Mobile 365 to a Silicon Valley company, Sybase, which all of you remember Sybase, uh, around number four in database management. The connectivity for me with BlackBerry in that story is John Chin. John Chin is one of the best CEOs in this country. He turned Sybase around. I went on the board after we negotiated the deal to sell Mobile 365. He asked me to go on the Sybase board. I went on in 2007. The end of that story is we sold it in 2010. One day our stock was 22. Uh, the next day, SAP came in and said, how about $63 a share? We sold it for $6 billion, and that was a time to say, let's go. So, you know, know when to go. Um, John went to SAP for two years. He went to Silver Lake then for a year and worked on the Take Dell pub private deal, and then he was pursued by a dozen major companies to be their CEO. BlackBerry, which was the iconic global brand, invented smartphone technology, mobile security, went off the edge of the earth. The board threw the two founders out who were from the University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Canada, which is a technical university of Canada, and uh, they sought out John Chin. And John Chin, who's a great guy and a really good friend of mine, said, um, you know, I'd like a really big challenge. And he talked to me and we had breakfast and I said, well, you will have a really big challenge because you're going to have to completely redo that company. John went in four years ago as CEO. I went on the board three and a half years ago to try to help him uh, do that. So uh, what we've done is everybody knows about a BlackBerry carrying around, designing, manufacturing, selling them all over the globe. The day that Steve Jobs showed up in his, you know, black jeans and turtleneck and said, I got this thing called the iPhone, may work, may not, boom, that was about the end of BlackBerry. And the BlackBerry story is the same as digital equipment, those of you who remember that, um, which is if you think in the tech industry that you are the leader and you dominate and you're going to stay around forever, uh, you better either sell the company then or you better think of something else to do because I've lived in it for all these years and if you don't think you're being pursued to the death every day and you need to change and move on, uh, you're going to be out of business and that's exactly what happened to BlackBerry. So. The answer to your question is, John came in, we have rebranded the company, we just actually changed from the NASDAQ to the New York Stock Exchange 60 days ago, so it's New York Stock Exchange Company now, and it has been, it, it still has, and I say that to you, it still has the most secure mobile communications network on earth for the type of business that anybody wants to do. Uh, number two, uh, we stopped manufacturing all devices. We have licensed that out to uh, uh, manufacturers around the globe, in Asia, Europe, etc. So there are BlackBerry devices being manufactured, white labeled, all kinds of stuff. We own all the internals of the security, the cyber protection, and all of the special sauce that BlackBerry does truly have over anybody else in the world. So uh, mobile security communications, we bought three cyber companies, we're in the cyber business big time, always have been, always will. We are one of the key players in autonomous vehicles. Uh, BlackBerry's owned QNX, which is a subsidiary they bought seven years ago. It is deeply embedded in the auto industry. They are clearly one of the two or three leaders in everything that's going to go on in the guts of how do you do autonomous everything digitization of every autonomous vehicle. So that is a huge growth area, and we are clearly a leader in IoT. BlackBerry connects in four or five sectors of industry, all kinds of things. Um, won't bore you with that. So, you know, it is a company that is stabilized at about a billion dollars worth of revenue. Its market cap, I think, is now three or four billion. Uh, we've got two billion dollars of cash in the bank. When John came in, it was on the verge of bankruptcy. 
So it's a completely different kind of company, change management, change people, change focus, changed everything. We'll see. Store jury's still out. Yeah, but it's done well since you've been there. I mean, it's uh, have anything to do with you me. have the Midas touch, like stuff <laughs> that you touch seems to just you know do very very well. Um, tell us something that you you served on a lot of boards, right? Mm -hmm. You served on public companies, private companies, big, small, uh, nonprofits. Um, but I'm curious, you know, like you were there when there was a lot of turmoil. You know, very, you were on the board of VeriSign as well, Sybase. Um, what goes on in these rooms that we might not expect? Mm -hmm. um, you've got very serious people in most boards at TN. You know, uh, the boards have got two primary functions in life, and they're, they tend to be a little more formal in public companies. I've served on 22 company boards and, you know, serve on five today. Um, the public companies are more formal. They're usually bigger. Some. Some are, some aren't. Um, you have to do all the standard thing, but the two things boards do is their most important job is to set the strategy of the company. And there's no more important job with that except execution. You can have the greatest strategy, and if you can't execute, well, you're not worth a nickel, right? So strategy at the board level and working that with the management team to determine are we on the right path? And if we're not, the board needs to be actively involved with management to reset that course. And number two is picking the CEO and the leadership of the company. And I, I can't tell you what I, I, how seriously I take both of those because I have seen billions of dollars go down the drain in my lifetime in company after company because they've got the wrong CEO, they've got the wrong management team, they don't change them out. Uh, if you got the wrong leadership, you should have acted yesterday because people do drive things and they've got their own opinions and they make hard decisions and if they're wrong, you're out of business or you lose billions of dollars. So those are the two primary issues. You do all the formal things like audit committees, nominating and governance to bring on new board members, uh, strategy. People have got different committees, but you know, there's four standard and compensation. I tend to have become, I won't say an expert, but I've focused on compensation. I've t chaired lots of compensation committees for public and private companies, and the reason I picked that was because I found out, strangely enough, the thing people were most interested in was their compensation. Isn't that strange? Right. So uh, one of my friends told me that when I first went on a board. I said, gee, they talked to me about what committee I'd like to be on. He said, you need to be on the compensation committee. He was dead right. So because how you compensate people drives how they act and what they do. It's unbelievable, but it's true. A few people are not like that. My, my mentor, Bob Beister at SAIC, not driven by compensation. The man could have been worth a billion dollars, gave it all away to the employees owned 2% of the stock, could have been on the front page of Fortune magazine every week, gave it all away, couldn't care less, built SAIC to serve the United States of America with the best science and technology, didn't care about money, truly did not. And, you know, you've selected a lot of CEOs. If you had to pick one sort of personal trait or characteristic of, of an awesome CEO, what would that one thing be? Well, one thing would be honesty. Don't ever deal with anybody who's not honest, ethical, uh, or is even on the borderline. You will live to regret it. And, you know, anytime you see that in any company, stay away from the company. Uh, that's the number one gate, in my opinion. Don't deal with unethical people. If they've got stuff in their background where they've run other companies into the ground, stay away from them because they're nothing but trouble and they'll get all of you in trouble. You'll be sued, on and on and on. So that's my first gate. The, the second one is somebody who's a, an action person. Uh, you can think all you want, but if you're going to build companies, you need to be an action person and you better be smart about the actions and decisions you take. Terrific. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. So you're an act, you spend half your time out in snow mass, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you travel the world doing cool stuff. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got into this and some of the cool experiences you guys have had. Uh, I got into it because of the Boy Scouts of America, and that's why I stay involved with them 30 years later. I've been the president and chairman of the National Capillary Council of the Boy Scouts, 
which is the largest youth-serving organization in Washington. Got 52,000 scouts, 25,000 adult volunteers, and you meet the most incredibly wonderful people in organizations like that because they're there for no reason but to help the youth of our city. Um, so I got my love from scouting. I grew up in a little dinky town, like I said, and there wasn't much to do except get in trouble or go hiking, so I decided to go hiking. So I was in a Boy Scout, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Eagle Scout, all that stuff, which was great stuff. And I, it gave me my appreciation of the outdoors. And um, the reason I ended up years later in Colorado was because in 1960, which most of you were not born in 1960, I went to the Boy, National Boy Scout Jamboree, which was held at, uh, in Colorado Springs under Pikes Peak. And I thought, wow, I live in this place that is a flat land. We have no snow. We have no mountains. This is the most unbelievable place on earth. And um, uh, that led me back to the mountains. And so um, I got interested in, I was always a hiker. I became a cyclist. I became a skier when I went, met my wife, my wife, Bonnie. She was from Minnesota. She'd skied, all that stuff. And uh, that led us to um, just being in the outdoors. So um, we like to go to the most remote places on earth and um, where you see the most unbelievable scenery and you think that you are a speck in time and any time you think that the world we live in is going to overpower you or you can't deal with it or there are things you can't do, just hike up to the top of a big ridge or a big mountain anywhere in the world where the wind blows and there's not a single sound and you will know that you are one tiny speck in the universe. And this should give you the feeling that there's a bigger thing going on here than our everyday junk. You should turn off CNN and Fox News and all those things because they don't amount to much in my mind uh, compared to what's really going on here. So we go to remote areas of the world, and, and I would say, I've you know, everybody's different. I've got my list of the three most unbelievable places on Earth on my list are Mount Everest Base Camp. And if you trek to Mount Everest Base Camp uh, during the climbing season and you see four or five hundred people from all over the world, every nationality, who are there to do one thing, try to get to the top of a 29,035 peak uh, and summit Everest, uh, it is the most unbelievable experience of your life. And, and trekking in the Kumbu region and walking on trails with yaks coming at you loaded up with paraphernalia and you're up against walls and there's a 5,000 foot drop off. It takes you about six and a half days uh, from Kathmandu. You fly into a little place called Lukla and you get off there at about 9,000 feet and for six and a half days you trek up to 18,000 feet to base camp. It is the most unbelievable experience and scenery you will ever see on earth and uh, then it's about four days back down. And uh, the most mystical place I've ever seen on earth is at about uh, 16,000 feet. And as you go up and you're going straight up for about three hours, you reach a plateau that is like a giant amphitheater surrounded with 22, 23, 24,000 foot mountains. Here is a place where the Sherpas who live in that region, the strongest human beings on earth bar none, have set and built a monument to every single person who's ever been killed on Everest. And their families have gone back there and put large monuments, small monuments, talking about the people who they lost. And you sit in that area for about an hour, and the clouds move through at 17,000 feet. And there is a spiritual, I don't care if you're spiritual or not, uh, there is a spiritualness of that place that is truly overpowering for everyone who ever hikes through there. Uh, it is the most moving place I've ever seen on earth. So every turn you make going to Everest Base Camp, you can't believe the magnitude of these mountains. They make our mountains, the Rockies, look like little dinky things, you know. Um, I'd say the second, and I'll stop on that, the second most unbelievable place on earth I've ever been is Svalbard. So, you know, put these on your list if you're an adventure. Uh, Svalbard is an archipelago that is about two hours flight from the northern tip of Norway into the Arctic Circle. And um, uh, riding on a snowmobile, uh, out through that for 100 miles to the ship in the ice, which is the only moored ship in the ice anywhere in the world. Uh, you stay on this. Polar bears are all around. It is the second most magnificent scenery on Earth. Not a peep, the wind, 
hundreds of miles you can see through there, frozen fjords for miles and miles. Uh, these are places that, you know, if you don't ever go, you should look at them on YouTube because they're worth spending a little time seeing. So we just got back from Rwanda two weeks ago. We'd had that on our list, so we went to trek up to the rainforests of northwest Uganda to Volcanoes National Park to see our cousins, the gorillas. And, uh, you know, the gorillas are as close as Tien and I are, and um, they really don't care about you. Um, you know, they're, they're 12, 1,400 pounds, giant silverbacks. You trek for about three hours up and up, about eight, 9,000 feet through rainforests, and uh, then you finally find the gorilla families, and we did it two different days, and there were 25 members in a family, and, um, you know, it's large males, females, small, uh, small gorillas, and if you don't think that we come from those species, you need to go see them. Their hands, their feet, their eyes, their expression, they, they talk to the guide, the guide who went with us has been up there 30 years. He's probably 70 years old. He was a porter for Diane Fossey when she was first there studying the gorillas. Uh, he talks to these gorillas. They know him. They jabber back at him. It's unbelievable. So anyway, those are the kind of things we do for fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Really awesome. <laughs> I think we got time for a couple of questions uh, from the audience, if anyone has a burning question. Dennis Lucy. In your business career, other than Dr. Feister, who else has had a positive impact, real positive impact, on your whole career? Yeah, Dennis, you know, you asked me. Uh, yeah, Bob Beister was really had an incredible impact on me. And uh, I would also say that um, I think of a number of people here in this area. I'd say Jack London, who's executive chairman down at CACI. Jack and I have known each other since we worked together at CACI in 1974 since then. Um, uh, a fellow who a lot of you may have known, Dan Bannister, who was the chairman CEO of DynCorp. Um, you know, um, George Johnson, for instance, out of George Mason. Uh, you know, they're currently people alive who have had, you know, not the ones who are gone. Um, I could list off a bunch, but those are some. Um, and the reason that I think that is because these people have been great teachers and mentors to me. And um, you, you watch what they do over time, and they were truly dedicated to a couple of things. And they were dedicated to building great companies. They were dedicated to doing the right thing, and they were dedicated to helping the United States of America and the Washington region. And they spent lots of time, money, and effort doing those things because they truly are what I'll call citizen business people, not just running their business. And what I've taken away from that is I've literally tried to do what I watch them do. You know, I've worked in NVTC since we founded it because I thought we needed a tech organization. I've been the chairman of the Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the largest business organization in the state. Uh, these are things we need to do because there are a lot of people in this country who don't like business. We've got lots of people on Capitol Hill. I've dealt with them for years. They don't know about business. They don't like us. They don't know what entrepreneurship is. They want to regulate and tax us to death. I've watched this my whole life. We need to fight that with all of our organizations and all of our might because that stops the creation of what we're all trying to do. So, you know, those are the kind of people who have had a lot of influence on me, people who just weren't in it for the money. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Keith Sawyer. Um, my question is, you know, as a follow-on to the you just made, you know, how do you, what do you think about the gains of globalization? how South America, I mean, what do you see, what countries do you see sort of pushing forward the right policies, right, that would take them into the next phase, and what should we do as a country to continue to, you know, stay in the lead and, and, and really have that place in the world as you know, an economy that continues to innovate and sort of lead the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. It's far above my pay grade, but I'll give you my answer. Um, what we need to do is we need to rededicate ourselves in the greater Washington region, and certainly here in the state of Virginia, to improving the business climate, and that means less taxation and regulation on business 
instead of burdening us endlessly with stuff that really doesn't do much to help us, you need to try to loosen that as much as possible. Number two is we need to help every entrepreneur we possibly can in this country because when you are in global businesses, as we all know, I, I worry about our economic situation. This is the greatest country on earth. It's still the land of opportunity. Most people want to come here, but we've got significant challenges on both the economic front with the rise of China and others, and we've got unbelievable problems with the rise of people who don't like our way of life and are dead set to change this world. And, you know, they don't like us. And uh, it's worse than it's been in a long time, and it's getting worse by the day. This is not getting better. So, you know, we need to all say uh, we need to help everybody in our community as well as everybody we can in this country to grow robust businesses, to be able to compete. And there are 50 different ways we can do that. Globalization to me is like the Internet in one way. The Internet is one of the greatest things that has ever been created, and it's one of the worst things that's ever been created. Because of what goes on on the Internet, it's got a whole dark side that I saw when I was at Network Solutions 20 years ago, right? And it's not good. And we've got every, uh, as, as Keith Alexander, who used to head NSA, said, we've got the largest theft in history out of this country. We've lost $1 trillion of intellectual property by theft over the Internet. I mean, our enemies have stolen our designs and our defense companies. They will steal every idea out of Silicon Valley, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> you know, um, it's, it's a bad place, but it's a great place. And globalization has been the same thing when you travel around the world. Globalization has been great for the United States of America, but it's not been good for all parts of the United States of America. You travel this country, we've got wastelands in this country that have been decimated by globalization. Will we ever get that back? I don't think so at all. I'm one of those guys who said, we're not recreating that. We better be moving on to the new technologies. So these things are both bad and good when you see them around the globe. They're mixed. Great answer. Yes, one more. If you could speak up, that'd be great. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for being here. With your role and interest in compensation, I'll be curious to your thoughts on compensation transparency and any trends that you're seeing in that regard. Yeah, if you're on boards and primarily public boards, why there's been a big push on uh, transparency of compensation. I'm all for that. I don't know why anybody wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, one of the things that makes the business community look bad, and it always has and it always will, I don't know how you change that except to change boards out. The boards set compensation. They approve compensation. People who are making outrageous sums that have terrible performance, they shouldn't be getting that kind of money. So the SEC's into it, uh, you know, all of the ISSs of the world who look at all of our public company stuff, uh, rate us, say you ought to vote, vote for directors or not. We deal with that every day. So, uh, you know, save for pay, it's a big deal on all our compensation committees. So all of these may be esoteric things to you if you don't deal with it, but they're basically about more transparency, fairness, and, you know, everybody's for pay for performance. The problem is, is if you're not performing and you're still getting millions and millions of dollars. So that push is not going to go away. Uh, serving on boards, I'd say there are three big pushes. That compensation transparency is one. Diversity of board membership is two in every respect, and we need more of that everywhere. And number three, I'd, I'd say is, um, you know, the issue of cyber has risen. It used to be five years ago, kind of number 10 on board's agendas. It's basically number one or two. Um, and so, uh, you know, the whole cyber issue we won't get into, except that it is an unbelievable nightmare, and this country does not have any kind of coherent policy to protect its companies or the federal government, still today, which is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, we, should, we should be burning down the doors of the Congress and everybody in power in this country in the last three or four administrations. I mean, how long do you go on? by having everything stolen from you and your economy is disrupted and country, company after company lose billions of dollars in stock value and you just keep turning over people. I mean, this is a mess. And I've been in the cyber business for 40 years. We used to call it information security. That's great. I mean, um, appreciate that. And thank you for everything you've been doing. I know you've done some things with the American Enterprise Institute on cyber and whatnot. Um, so. 
we really appreciate your comments this morning. I think we're a little bit out of time, but the themes are basically honesty, transparency, focus on shareholder value, doing the right thing, and um, really it's been an honor to have you, Mike. So uh, thanks for sharing your morning with us, and hopefully you can stick around a little bit. And uh, But sure. I know you're busy, but thank you so much. Let's thank you, T, and thanks, everybody. <laughs>